Hello and welcome back to Zoology 141. Today we're going to take a look at the muscular system. So after you complete today's lecture, you should understand key terms including the words origin, insertion, and action. You should also be able to describe the different criteria used to name muscles. You should be able to classify fiber and fascicle arrangements for any muscle. And you should also be able to describe the difference between a power lever and a speed lever. You should be able to classify each of the joint muscle combinations as one of the three lever systems, that is first class levers, second class levers, or third class levers. And finally, you should be able to identify the origin, insertion, and action of about 70 selected muscles. So if you remember back to the last lecture, we talked about the three different types of muscle being skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Well, today we're going to focus on the muscular system, and remember an organ system consists of organs, that is structures made up of multiple tissue types. And so today we're going to be talking about the skeletal muscles, which themselves are of course made up of muscular tissue, they're made up of connective tissue, nervous tissue, and so on. And so the voluntarily controlled muscles of the body make up the human muscular system. Now there are over 700 muscles in the body with new ones being described periodically. You're only going to need to know a small percentage of these, approximately 70 to 80 muscles. Now the muscular system and muscle tissue contribute to homeostasis in the body by producing movement, as you know, stabilizing body positions, and also producing heat, for example when we shiver. So when it comes time for the exam, you will be responsible for being able to identify the 70 to 80 muscles that I've selected for you to learn. You'll also need to know their origin, insertion, and action. The origin of a muscle is the part that connects to a bone that does not move very much uh, when that muscle contracts. And normally the origin is located proximally, that is closer to the point of attachment on the body. On the other hand, the insertion is the attachment to a bone that is very mobile. So the most mobile part is called the insertion. For example, if we look at the biceps brachii muscle pictured here, you can see it has two connection points. One is proximal up close to the scapula, and the other one is distal on the radius. And so which of these do you think will be the origin and which will be the insertion? Well, if you said that the origin would be along the scapula, you're correct. The scapula area is the least mobile area when the biceps contracts. You should know that when the biceps contracts, the elbow flexes, bringing the forearm closer to you. And so the radius, or radial tuberosity, will be the insertion for the biceps brachii muscle. And finally, we have something called the action. The action is just a description of what the muscle does. And so, for example, with a biceps brachii muscle, when that muscle contracts and shortens, it helps to flex the elbow, that is, reduce the angle between the humerus and the radius and the ulna. Now, there's various different types of criteria that are used to name and describe muscles. Some muscles are named for their location in the body. For example, we'll learn about the temporalis muscle, which is located on the temporal bone. Another way that muscles can be named is by their shape. For example, the deltoid muscle is a nice triangular muscle, uh, whereas the trapezius is a much larger uh, triangle or diamond shaped muscle. And finally, some muscles are named for their very large or very small size. For example, the gluteus maximus is the largest of the gluteal muscles, whereas the gluteus minimus is the smallest. And finally, very long muscles or very long heads of muscles are often called longus. Another way that muscles are named is by the direction of muscle fiber or fascicle attachment. For example, we have rectus muscles, and rectus muscles are named because their fibers run very straight. For example, we have a rectus abdominis, that is your six pack or your abs. There's also transversus, which represent fibers that run at right angles. For example, we have the transversus abdominis. These are muscles that have fibers that run diagonally. We can also name muscles based on their numbers of origins. For example, the biceps brachii actually has two origins, and that's why it's called biceps, or two heads. We can also name muscles based on their location of attachments. For example, the sternocleidomastoid is a muscle that attaches to the sternum, to the clavicles, and also to the mastoid. And so these are very easy muscles to remember because if you know the name, you already know their origins and insertions. And finally, some muscles are named for the action of the muscle. That is what it does. For example, flexor muscles flex and extensor muscles extend. And we tend to find those uh, on either side of both the hands and the feet. 
While we're on the subject of naming muscles, we should also say something about the arrangement of the fascicles. Remember that a fascicle was a bundle of muscle fibers held together by connective tissue. And the arrangement of fascicles can determine the amount of movement when a muscle shortens and also determine the muscle's power. Now, long fibers that are more parallel to one another uh, usually shorten more but do not have a powerful contraction. For example, we'll see this in a muscle called the sartorius, which runs up and down the leg. On the other hand, if we have a bipennate or multipennate muscle that have a lot of short fibers, they shorten a little but are quite powerful when they do shorten. So here's a few different examples of different types of fascicle arrangements. At letter B, you can see a convergent arrangement of fascicles, and we find this in the pectoralis muscle. Now, the pectoralis muscle originates on the sternum and the clavicle, and all these fibers converge into one tendon that attaches to the proximal part of the humerus. And so these convergent fibers give us a lot of power, but not a whole lot of motion. That is, when it shortens, we get a very forceful contraction, but it doesn't shorten the muscle uh, substantially. Another type of anatomy that we see is the circular anatomy, pictured on the right, and circular arrangement of fascicles is usually seen around body openings, for example, around the eyes and also the mouth. We have also a lot of fusiform muscles. Fusiforms are sort of teardrop-shaped muscles uh, that look much like a tuna to me, and so the biceps brachii would be good examples of fusiform muscles. And then we have parallel muscles. These are muscles that have very long fibers that are parallel to one another. And one example here is the sartorius. Again, these muscles can shorten substantially, which is good because they're long, but they don't generate a whole lot of force when they do. And then we have the pennate muscles, such as the multipennate, bipennate, and unipennate. These tend to have uh, very short fascicle arrangements, and they can give us very strong contractions that can uh, be very forceful. Now we're going to move on to talk about lever systems. And lever systems deals a little bit with the physics of muscle contraction. And so the components of a lever system consist of a lever or rigid bar, which in this case is going to be a bone that moves on a fixed point called a fulcrum. Now the fulcrum here is going to be a joint. The effort is the force applied to that lever to move a resistance known as the load. In this case, the effort is going to be provided by the contraction of skeletal muscles. And finally, the load is what we're trying to move. Now, this load or resistance can be because we're trying to lift a heavy object, or maybe we're just trying to hold our own head up. And so load can both be something external or something internal in the body. Okay, here's a very simple diagram of a lever system. So first of all, we have our lever in brown. Remember, the lever is just a fixed rod. In this case, it's usually going to be a bone. The fulcrum here is the pivot point of that lever, and the fulcrum, in our case, is going to be a joint. And then the effort with the orange arrow is going to be the force of muscular contraction. And this effort is trying to oppose the force of the load. And the load is whatever we're trying to lift or move. Now, lever systems are classified into one of two very broad categories, ones that operate at a mechanical advantage or ones that operate at a mechanical disadvantage. So lever systems that operate at a mechanical advantage are called power levers. And that's because we have a load that's closer to the fulcrum and the effort is further away from a fulcrum. And as a result, we can have a very small effort move a very large load. On the other hand, levers that operate at a mechanical disadvantage are called speed levers. And they're called speed levers because the load is located far from the fulcrum, but the effort is located close to the fulcrum. And so they're not very efficient at moving a very large weight, but they do tend to have a very large range of motion. So we can have a lot of movement and a lot of very quick movement. So speed levers are good at speed, whereas power levers are good at moving a very heavy object. So here's an example of a power lever system, that is, a system that operates at mechanical advantage. And remember, to operate at a mechanical advantage, the load has to be very close to the fulcrum, and the effort has to be far away from the fulcrum. And so here you can see that we have uh, our lever is placed underneath our load, and our fulcrum is just to the left of that load. And so imagine this as being a very large rock that you're trying to move by using a crowbar or pry bar. Now, where on that lever would you push to have the most mechanical advantage? If you pushed very close to the fulcrum, it would be very difficult to move that large stone. On the other hand, if you pushed at the very end of the lever, it would be much easier to move that load. And so the further the way the effort is from the fulcrum and the load, the greater mechanical advantage this lever system will have. 
On the other hand, a lever system that operates at a mechanical disadvantage has the effort closer to the fulcrum than it is to the load. So the load is further away from the fulcrum than the effort is. And so if you imagine having the same load that we had in the last line, let's say a 50 ton boulder, it's going to be very, very difficult to apply enough effort to move this load efficiently. On the other hand, if the load isn't that great, we do have a lot of range of motion. That is, if we push down on that lever and we're able to move it, we'll be able to move at a much larger angle or range of motion than we could a power lever. So in summary, we have two basic types of lever systems. Those where the effort is further away than the load from the fulcrum, and in this case we say these lever systems operate at a mechanical advantage and are power levers. On the other hand, if we have effort closer to the fulcrum than the load, then we have a lever that operates at a mechanical disadvantage, and we call this a speed lever, because the lever can actually have a very large range of motion and move very, very quickly, but it can't move very heavy things efficiently. In addition to having these two major classifications of lever systems, we also classify levers into three different classes depending on the relative position of the effort, the fulcrum, and the load. The first system we have is called a first class lever. In a first class lever system, the fulcrum is between the load and the effort, and it may be a power lever that operates at a mechanical advantage or a speed lever that operates at a mechanical disadvantage. In an exam, you're going to be responsible for recognizing which is a first class, second class, or third class levers. And so in looking at a lever system, you should be able to, to identify the fulcrum, the load, and the effort. So look at the picture at right. Here's an example of a first class lever system. And we're looking at the muscles that hold up the head uh, from flexing. And so the load here is going to be the weight of the front of the head or the face. The fulcrum here is the joint known as the atlanto-occipital joint, and this is the joint that allows you to bow your head. And the effort supplied here is by the muscles of the back of the neck, uh, for example, the trapezius muscle that is opposing the load of the face. And so here you can see the order of the components of the lever system is load fulcrum effort, or LFE. And the way that I remember this is by making up a stupid mnemonic, uh, which is I love funny emoticons. And you can remember that I stands for one, and love is load, funny is fulcrum, and emoticons is effort. I love funny emoticons. Now, if you can think of a better mnemonic device, please email me. I'll give you a point extra credit if I think it's better than mine, because this one's pretty bad. But it does help you to remember the order of the components in the lever system. Now, as I said in the last slide, a first-class lever system can operate at a mechanical advantage or a mechanical disadvantage, depending on the orientation of the fulcrum to the effort and the load. And so the atlanto-occipital joint and the associated muscles are one that operate at a very large mechanical advantage. So here's an example from my own experience. For the past five or six years, I've spent my summers in Papua New Guinea doing some fish research. And in New Guinea, it's mainly an agrarian lifestyle in most of these villages uh, where people are planting their crops in one area of the village and might hike two or three miles to where they live. As a result, they need a way to transport a lot of their crops and their tools and things like that. So they have this bag that they wear on the back of their head called a belum. And a belum is just a very large string bag. It's very expansive and you can carry a lot of weight in it. And they just place the handle of that bag over the very tip of their forehead and they're able to walk for long distances carrying a load of 40, 50, sometimes even 60 or 70 pounds. And the reason they can do this is that the atlanto-occipital joint is a lever system that operates at a mechanical advantage. It's very easy to move a very large weight because of the arrangement of the fulcrum, the effort, and the load. And so you can see this lady is carrying a very large load in her belum, and in fact it looks to be maybe a four to five year old child. And so that's just a testament to how efficient first class lever systems can be. Okay, our next lever system is a second class lever system. In a second class system, we have the load located between the fulcrum and the effort. And a good example of second class lever would be a wheelbarrow. We had the fulcrum at the end being the wheel, the load in the middle, and then the effort applied at the other end. And so second class levers always operate at a mechanical advantage. They're very good at moving a very heavy or large weight uh, very easily, but they can't move at a very long distance. So in the body, the only example I can think of for a second class lever would be the joints between the metatarsals and the phalanges. So that's the metatarsal phalangeal joint. And so when you point your toes downward, we call this plantar flexion. That is, you're pointing to the plantar surface of the earth, where you would plant your crops. And so the arrangement of a second class lever system is effort, 
load, and fulcrum. Effort here is supplied by the contraction of the gastric nemus muscles and soleus muscles. The load here is all the weight that's positioned on the top of your tibia, which is supporting the weight of your body, and the fulcrum here is the metatarsophalangeal joints. So think about how much weight you can lift when you plantar flex your toes. Well, chances are you can do this with your own body weight. So think about how heavy you are. You may not even go to the gym um, once a week, twice a week, may not go ever, but still you're able to move a very large weight very easily because this is a second class lever system that operates at a mechanical advantage. And again, you should be able to recognize and identify a second class lever system by the relative placement of the different elements because we have effort at one end, the load in the middle, and the fulcrum at the other end, ELF. And so the way that I remember this is that an ELF is a second class citizen. An ELF stands for effort, load, and fulcrum. Our third type of lever system is called a third class lever system. Here the effort is applied between the fulcrum and the load. And third class levers operate at a mechanical disadvantage and so are speed levers rather than power levers and they are the most common lever system in the body. So at the right hand side of the screen you can see a good example of a third class lever. The load here is the weight that we're holding in our hand. The fulcrum would be the elbow joint and the effort that's being applied is applied by the contraction of the biceps brachii muscle. Remember the biceps muscle inserts just distal to the elbow and it attaches in something called the radial tuberosity. And so when the biceps muscle contracts, it flexes the forearm and moves the load. Now because the effort is very close to the fulcrum and the load is very far away from it, we operate at a mechanical disadvantage. So we're not very good at moving very heavy weights with our biceps muscles, but we do have an amazing amount of range of motion, and also we can move this joint very, very quickly because it is a third class lever. So just to recap, third class levers are the most common type of leverage system in the body, and they operate at a mechanical disadvantage. The acronym you should remember is LEF, that is Load Effort Fulcrum, and the only way I remember this is that third class levers are all that are left, LEF. Now before we go on to learn about the 70 or 80 muscles that I have selected for you to learn, we need to talk about prime movers, synergists, and antagonists. So when we're looking at what muscles do, it's important to know that some muscles share their functions with other muscles. And in that case, the muscle that does the majority of the work is called the prime mover or agonist. The agonist is the major number one muscle responsible for a particular action. On the other hand, a synergist is a muscle that helps out. It doesn't exert the majority of the force or effort, but it does assist the prime mover or the agonist in its contraction. It can also help by fixating adjacent joints to make the contraction of the agonist more successful. In this case, we call these fixators. And finally, it's very important to realize that muscles can only shorten forcefully. That is, we can only do work by shortening. We cannot do work by extending. Muscles do extend, but they do so passively. They can't exert force when they do that. And so if you think of the movements of the forearm, flexion is a result of the contraction of the biceps brachii muscle, whereas extension of the elbow is a result of the contraction of the triceps brachii muscle. And so these two muscles are called antagonists, and antagonists are muscles that produce opposite movement. So the prime mover here could be the biceps brachii, and the antagonist would be the triceps brachii. On the other hand, the triceps brachii is the prime mover of elbow extension, and the biceps brachii would be an antagonist of elbow extension. Okay, we're going to start out the lecture by talking about select muscles of the head, neck, and face. And I've only selected a small number of these for you. And these are generally muscles that help us to chew our food, that give us some facial expressions, or help us to move our neck. Our first muscle are the orbicularis oculi, and these are the muscles that surround the orbits, or eyes. And the origin here are the frontal and maxillary bones, and the insertion is the skin of the eyelid. And orbicularis oculi are circular muscles, and their function is to close the eyes when we blink or wink. So remember, orbicularis means circular, and oculi means eyes. These are the muscles that surround the eyes and help us to blink. We also have a second orbicularis muscle in the face, and that would be the orbicularis oris. Oris here means oral cavity or mouth, and the origin of the orbicularis oris is the mandible and maxilla, that is the upper and lower jaws, and the insertion is the skin on the edge of the mouth. 
in the orbicularis oris helps us to purse our lips as in kissing or whistling. Orbicularis oris. Our next muscle is the zygomaticus. If you recall back to a couple lectures ago when we covered the skeletal system, you'll remember that the zygomatic is the cheekbone. And so the origin of the zygomatics here is the zygomatic bone. The insertion is the skin of the corner of the mouth. And the function of the zygomatics is to raise the corners of the mouth as in smiling. So zygomaticus is your cheekbone muscle that helps you to smile. Another facial muscle located just inferior to the zygomaticus is the buccinator or bucinator. And the origin of the bucinator is the molar region of the maxilla and the mandible, so the posterior parts of these two bones, and the insertion is the orbicularis oris muscle. And the function of the bucinator or buccinator muscle is to compress the cheek. And if you've taken medical terminology or you know anything about dentistry, you'll know that the term buccal or buccal refers to the cheek. And so the bucinator muscle is important for contracting the cheeks and holding the food on the tops of the molars and premolars so that we can efficiently chew it. The bucinator is also an important muscle for whistling. <whistles> and finally, probably one of my favorite muscles having to do with facial expression is the platysma. The platysma is a very superficial muscle located within the skin or just deep the skin, and the origin here is the fascia or connective tissue on the upper thorax and the lower neck. And the insertion here is the mandible and the skin of the lower face. And the platysma doesn't really do any usable work, but what it does do is when it's contracted, it elevates, increases the skin of the lower neck, and depresses the lower lip. And so if you ever watch the old Incredible Hulk episodes where the Incredible Hulk was played by Lou Ferrigno, every time he would get mad, he would turn green, he'd rip off his clothes, and he would also crease his neck and be like, Grrr! and those creases in his neck are caused by the contraction of the platysma. Again, platysma doesn't do any really usable work, but it lets us know that somebody is pretty ticked off. We also see contraction of the platysma when somebody is straining or lifting a very heavy load. Now we have muscles that are more important than just providing facial expression, and these are the muscles that help to close the jaw. And the two muscles that I would like you to know are the temporalis and the masseter. The temporalis is named for its origin upon the squamous part of the temporal bone, and its insertion is on the coronoid portion and ramus of the mandible. On the other hand, the masseter originates on the maxilla and zygomatic bones, and inserts again on the ramus and angle of the mandible. Now both muscles are very important for elevating or closing the jaws during mastication or chewing, and probably the masseter is the most important, with the temporalis being a close second. Now it's important to realize that if we have muscles that close the mouth, we must also have a muscle that opens the mouth, because muscles can only contract in one direction. And so the muscle responsible for opening the mouth is called the digastric muscle. Remember, di here means two, gastric means belly, and so this is a muscle that has two bellies. One of the bellies, you can see, extends from the hyoid region to around the mastoid process, and the other belly is more ventral, extending from the hyoid to the chin. So the insertion here is the hyoid bone, the origin is the mandible and mastoid process, and the action is depressing the jaw or opening the mouth. Now I said in the previous slide and slides previous to that, that all muscles tend to have an antagonist, that is a muscle that contracts in the opposite direction. And so the prime movers of closing the jaw were the masseter and the temporalis, and the antagonistic muscle there is the digastric. Well, when we have an antagonistic pair of muscles, it's important to realize that usually one of them is going to be stronger than the other. And a good example of this are the jaw opening and jaw closing muscles. Remember, jaw closing muscles were the masseter and temporalis, very, very powerful muscles. On the other hand, the digastric, the muscle that opens the jaw, is not very powerful. And that's why when people catch crocodiles and alligators and things like that, they're able to jump on their back and close their mouth with their hands and simply tape that closed with electrical tape or duct tape. That tape wouldn't hold in keeping the mouth open because it's much stronger in closing, but it's actually got a very, very weak jaw opening muscle, and that's because in antagonists, usually one muscle is a lot stronger than the other one. Now the last two jaw muscles I would like you to know are the pterygoids, and the pterygoids can be divided into the medial pterygoid, which is in green, or the lateral pterygoid, which is in red. And so the medial pterygoid originates on the sphenoid and maxilla, and inserts on the angle and ramus of the mandible. 
On the other hand, the lateral pterygoid originates from the sphenoid and inserts on the mandibular condyle and temporal mandibular joint. So both of these muscles are important for elevating and protracting the mandible. Remember, elevating is closing the mandible, protracting is putting that jaw forward, and together they also help to move the mandible to the side for that side-to-side -side movement that we get when a cow is chewing its cud. You remember the molars are going side-to-side -side and they become very efficient at chewing or masticating plant matter this way. Another somewhat important muscle that's on the anterior part of the neck is called the sternohyoid. And again, it has the origin and insertion in the name. The origin here is the manubrium of the sternum and also the clavicle. And the insertion here is the lower part of the hyoid bone. And what the sternohyoid does is help to depress the larynx during swallowing and speaking. Okay, now we're going to move on to the muscles of the posterior vertebral column, and these include the erector spiny muscles, as well as a muscle known as the quadratus lumborum. And so the erector spinae complex consists of three different muscles, all of which connect to the spine. And the first of these is called the iliocostalis, and the iliocostalis originates on the iliac crest and inserts on the angles of the ribs in the thoracic region. Again, this is one of those muscles where the origin and insertion are in the name. Ilio referring to ilium and costalis referring to the ribs. So in muscles like this, the origin is always listed first and insertion is listed second. And the function of the iliocostalis is for extension of the back and also lateral flexion of the back. And that's because this is a paired muscle. If we contract both at once, it helps us to erect the back. Whereas if we only contract one side, this can help with bending the lumbar spine to one side, which is known as lateral flexion. Just medial to the iliocostalis is another paired muscle group called the longissimus. And the origin of the longissimus are the transverse processes of the vertebrae, and the insertion is the mastoid process and also the thoracic and cervical vertebrae. And just like the iliocostalis, the function of the longissimus is for extension of the back if we contract both muscles, or lateral flexion if we just contract one. And finally, the last muscle of the erector spiny complex is the spinalis. The name spinalis refers to the fact that it originates on the spines of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae and inserts on the spines of the thoracic and cervical vertebrae. And just like the other two muscles, this helps with extension of the back. And so people can have a hard time remembering which one's on the outside, which one's on the inside, and which one's on the middle. And so there's a very helpful mnemonic device to remember the order of these muscles. And that is, I like spaghetti. Iliocostalis, longissimus, spinalis. Another muscle that helps to erect and also laterally flex the spine is the quadratus lumborum. The quadratus lumborum originates on the iliac crest and lumbar fascia, which we'll see in a minute, and it inserts on the transverse processes of the vertebrae L1 to L4 and also on the 12th rib. And just like the other muscles, its function is for lateral flexion of the spine and also for extension of the lumbar spine. It also has a minor function in assisting with forced inspiration, that is, breathing in. Okay, now we're going to move on to talk about muscles that are used in breathing. And the first two muscles are used in inspiration, that is in bringing air into the lungs to help oxygenate the bloodstream. 
And so the first of these muscles are called the external intercostals. And the external intercostals, as the name implies, are located intercostally or between the ribs. And their origin is the inferior border of the rib above, and insertion is the superior border of the rib below. All you really need to know is that they're connected from rib to rib. And the other muscle is the diaphragm, which is actually located between the thoracic cavities and the abdominal cavities. And its origin is on the inferior rib cage and also the sternum, and insertion onto something called the central tendon. And so here you can see a picture of the diaphragm. It's that dome-shaped purple muscle beneath the ribs. And normally, when the diaphragm is relaxed, it has this nice dome shape. On the other hand, when the diaphragm contracts, it depresses downwards, and what that does is increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, and that in turn helps to bring air into the lungs from the trachea and the mouth. And so the action of both the external intercostals and the diaphragm is for inspiration, that is, breathing in. There's another intercostal called the internal intercostal, which again is interior to the external intercostals. I'm not going to ask you to identify these muscles separately on an exam or to say what the origins and insertions are, besides that these are muscles that originate on one rib and insert on the other. And the function of the internal intercostals is to help depress the rib cage and to aid in forced exhalation. So normally exhalation can happen passively as the diaphragm relaxes. However, if you're really exerting yourself, you might have to do some forced exhalation to further get that air out of your lungs. We also used forced exhalation when we play musical instruments, for example, the trumpet, trombone, things like that. And that forced expiration, in part, comes from the contraction of the internal intercostals, which aid in forced exhalation. Okay, we're now going to move on to look at the muscles that surround the abdominal wall. And these include four pairs of overlapping sheet-like muscles known as the rectus abdominis, external obliques, internal obliques, and transverse abdominis. Okay, the most medial of the abdominal muscles is, of course, the rectus abdominis. And remember that rectus means straight, and of course, abdominis refers to the abdomen. So the rectus abdominis is your six-pack, or your eight-pack, or in some cases, your keg. And so it originates on the pubic crest down below in blue, and inserts on the xiphoid and also the costal cartilages. And so think about what this muscle will do if it contracts. If it shortens forcefully, that's going to cause the lumbar spine to flex or bend forward. And so the function of the rectus abdominis is to flex and rotate the lumbar spine. So doing sit-ups would be a good exercise to build up your rectus abdominis muscle. Located laterally to your rectus muscle are the external obliques. External means that they're on the outside, and obliques means that they have fibers that run diagonally. And here you can see that the fibers of the external obliques run from top to bottom. They seem to be pointing down towards the groin area. And the origin of the external oblique are the lower eight ribs, and insertion is something called the linea alba. Now, linea means line, and alba means white, and so this is literally the white line. It's a connective tissue line that runs down the center of the abdomen. And the external obliques connect this linea alba through something called aponeuroses. The aponeurosis is that broad, fibrous, white membrane that is in between the linea alba and the external obliques. And so these are paired muscles. And just like any paired muscle, we get different movement if we contract both at the same time or we contract them signally. If we contract both at the same time, these are synergists of lumbar spine flexion. That is, they help us to do a normal sit-up. On the other hand, if we contract one more than another, we can get some rotation as well. And so they're also used in rotation of the lumbar spine. So here you can see this woman that is doing a sit-up, but she's doing more of a sideways crunch where she's curling to one side. That would exercise both the rectus abdominis and also the external obliques. Remember, the fibers of the external obliques go from top to bottom. Now, below the external obliques, we have the internal obliques. The internal obliques originate on the lumbar fascia and iliac crest, which we'll see in a minute, and they insert on the linea alba and pubic crest, and also the last three ribs. The action for the internal oblique is the same as the external oblique. That is, it helps with flexion of the lumbar spine and also rotation of the lumbar spine. I should also note that it helps out with lateral flexion and generating a little bit of abdominal pressure.
Now, the big way to differentiate the external obliques from the internal obliques is the internal obliques aren't quite as tall or as high, and also look at the direction of the fibers. The fibers here are going from bottom to top, and so they're running from the iliac crest upwards. And so fiber direction is the best way uh, to differentiate the external obliques, which have fibers that run down, from the internal obliques, which have fibers that run up. And finally, we have something called the transversus abdominis, which originates on the lumbar fascia of the back and also the iliac crest, and it inserts on the linea alba and the pubic crest. And the action of the transversus abdominal muscle is to compress the abdominal contents, which is useful uh, when we're bearing down during childbirth, and it's also used to generate intra-abdominal pressure when we're trying to forcefully defecate. So if you're constipated or you haven't been eating a lot of fiber, uh, sometimes you have to take a deep breath, inhale, and splint your chest cavity so you can provide more compression to your abdominal area and help to get that defecation reflex going. And that's why people sometimes have a very strained voice when they are defecating because they are contracting their transversus abdominis muscles and at the same time they've taken a big breath and are holding that breath in to help keep that pressure isolated down in the abdominal cavity to help with the defecation reflex. That's probably more information than you ever wanted to know about pooping. Okay, now we're going to move on to the muscles of the posterior thorax, and the most conspicuous of these has to be the trapezius. The trapezius is a very large diamond-shaped muscle which connects to the base of the skull, to the spines of the scapulae, and also to the spines of the thoracic vertebrae. And so the function of the trapezius muscle is twofold. One thing it does help us to do is to extend the neck or extend the cervical spine or even hyperextend it. The other function of the trapezius muscle is to shrug the shoulders, that is, elevate them and pull them upwards. And so here you can see somebody that's doing a shoulder shrugging exercise in order to build up the trapezius muscle. So lateral and inferior to the trapezius muscle is another very large muscle called your latissimus dorsi or your lats. The latissimus dorsi is a very large muscle, originates on the spines of the thoracic vertebrae, and inserts on the proximal part of the humerus specifically the intertubercular sulcus. And the function of the latissimus dorsi is forceful extension and adduction of the arms. Remember, extension of the arms is putting them down uh, as if you're using a hammer, and so oftentimes I call this the whack-a-mole muscle. If you've ever played whack-a-mole or whack-a-gopher at a carnival, that's where the little animals pop out of the holes, and you try to hit them with a hammer, and so that's using your latissimus dorsi muscle. Another exercise we can do to build up our lats is, of course, the lat pull-down that you see at right. The person starts with their arms extended, and then they pull them back down. And pulling back down or adducting the arms uh, is one of the functions of the latissimus dorsi muscle. I should also point out uh, the thoracolumbar fascia. Now, the thoracolumbar fascia is an origin for lots of different muscles, including the latissimus dorsi. Now, remember, thoraco means thorax, and lumbar means lumbar, of course, those are regions of the spine, and the fascia here is that white fibrous connective tissue that connects from the thoracic spines and the lumbar spines and eventually connects to the latissimus dorsi muscle. If you ever see this tissue, uh, if you ever have a chance to dissect a cat or human cadaver, it doesn't seem real. It's very tough, it's plastic feeling, it doesn't look like anything you'd ever see in a living human body, and that's the thoracolumbar fascia. So a synergist of the latissimus dorsi muscle is the teres major. Teres here means circular, and major means that it's the largest of the two muscles. And so the origin here is the posterior border of the scapula, and the insertion is the proximal part of the humerus, that is the intertubercular sulcus. The action of the teres major is the same as the action of the latissimus dorsi. It helps to adduct the arms and also immediately rotate the arms. So now we're going to look at some muscles that are deep to the trapezius. So we've removed the trapezius, and that exposes two other muscles, the levator scapulae and the rhomboid major. The levator scapulae has the function of the muscle in the name. That is, its function is to elevate the scapula, and the origin here are the transverse processes of these first four cervical vertebrae, and the insertion is the medial border of the scapulae. The function, again, is to elevate and adduct the scapula. 
The other muscle that helps with scapular adduction is the rhomboid major and minor. Here we're just going to call them the rhomboids. So the origin of the rhomboid major is the spinous processes of the seventh cervical vertebrae through the fifth thoracic vertebrae, and the insertion here is on the medial part of the scapula, that is the blade of the scapula. And the function of the rhomboids is to elevate and adduct the scapula, and also to stabilize the scapula during other muscle movements of the arm. So at the picture below, you can see a good example of an exercise that would build up your rhomboids. This person is adducting their scapula, uh, retracting their scapula, which brings the flat blade part of the scapulas closer together. So this slide just shows a summary of the three superficial back muscles that we've looked at so far. The trapezius, the teres major, and the latissimus dorsi. Remember, the function of the trapezius was for extension and hyperextension of the neck, as well as shrugging the shoulders. The teres major was a synergist of the latissimus dorsi, and the latissimus dorsi's major function was for forceful extension of the forearms and also adduction of the forearms. Now we're going to turn over and take a look at the muscles of the anterior thorax. And the first of these is the serratus anterior muscle. This muscle is named for its multiple serrated looking fibers. And so it originates on the first eight ribs and inserts on the medial scapula. And this is a muscle that helps for forceful protraction of the scapula. Protraction is basically sort of like abduction and that the scapula is turning away from its normal orientation. And we use this for protracting the arm and punching. And so we tend to see very well-developed uh, serratus anterior muscles and people that do a lot of punching, for example, boxers. Now located just medial to the serratus anterior is the subclavius muscle. This muscle is named for its location, which is just below the clavicles. It originates on ribs three through five and inserts on the coracoid process, which was that little pointy out process on the front part of the scapula. And so when this muscle contracts, it leads to protraction of the scapula, which was used in punching. And so this muscle is a synergist of the serratus anterior. Our next muscle is one that you're probably familiar with, and that is the pectoralis major. The pectoralis major originates on the sternum and also in the clavicle and inserts on the proximal humerus and the intertubercular sulcus. And the action, of course, of the pectoralis major is flexion of the arms and also adduction of the arms. And so if you ever do a butterfly stroke or something like that while swimming, this is going to help build up the pectoralis major muscles. Now we're going to take a look at muscles that cross the shoulder joint. Most of these muscles either stabilize the shoulder or help for abduction, adduction, flexion, or extension of the shoulder. And the first of these is the deltoid. The deltoid is a muscle on the side of your shoulder. It has a triangle-shaped appearance. The origin here is the acromion and spine of the scapula and also the clavicle. And the insertion is the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. And that's why we had you learn all those specific little landmarks on the bones because most of these landmarks are in fact origins or insertions for muscles. So now you know that that little rough patch on the superior one-third of the humerus known as the deltoid tuberosity is the insertion part for the deltoid muscle. And so the main function of the deltoid muscle is abduction of the arm and shoulder. And so when you put your arm out to the side, that is abduction. The other thing that the deltoid does is it helps us to extend the arms if you're holding them outwards zombie style. So the function of the deltoid is abduction and extension of the shoulder. Our next three muscles are located on the scapula and are part of the rotator cuff. So the origin here is somewhere along the scapula. Insertion is going to be somewhere along the proximal humerus. And so these include the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis. The supraspinatus was located in the supraspinous fossa above the scapular spine. The infraspinatus is located in the infraspinous fossa just inferior to the scapular spine. And the subscapularis was located on the back side in the subscapular fossa. The function of the supraspinatus is to abduct the arm of the shoulder, whereas that of the infraspinatus is to laterally rotate and adduct the arm, whereas the subscapularis functions mainly to medially rotate the arm of the shoulder joint. In reality, most of these muscles are very important as fixators of the arm and shoulder. 
Now we're going to take a look at muscles that cross the elbow joint. Remember the elbow joint was a hinge joint and really its only possible functions were flexion and extension. And so the biceps brachii muscle is located on the anterior part of the elbow and also the humerus and its function is for flexion of the forearm. So it originates via two heads. One of the heads attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula and the other originates on the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Both of these insert on the radial tuberosity of the radius and this is the lone insertion site for the biceps brachii muscle. And again, the function of the biceps brachii muscle is flexion of the elbow and also a little bit of supination of the forearm. This is in fact the main mover of forearm flexion and supination. Located beneath the biceps brachii is the brachialis muscle. The brachialis muscle originates on the proximal part of the humerus and it inserts on the coronoid process of the ulna. The function here again is flexion of the elbow. And so the brachialis muscle is a synergist of the biceps brachii. Our next muscle is the brachioradialis muscle. This is also a synergist of the biceps brachii. It originates just above the lateral condyle of the humerus. Remember the lateral condyle is going to be located on the thumb side if we're standing in standard anatomical position. And the insertion here is the distal part of the radius. And so the function again because it's a synergist is flexion of the elbow. Now let's take a look at the muscles of the posterior part of the elbow. And these include the triceps brachii. The triceps brachii is named for its location, the brachii or the upper arm, and also the fact that it has three heads. Here we can see two of those heads, the lateral head and the long head. The long head of the triceps muscle uh, originates from the scapula, whereas the medial and lateral heads originate from the humerus. All of them insert onto the olecranon process of the ulna. And the function of the triceps brachii muscle, of course, is forceful extension of the elbow. And so the triceps brachii muscle is an antagonist of the biceps brachii muscle. Now we're going to take a look at just a few of the muscles that are in the forearm. In general, the muscles in the forearm are going to be used to either flex or extend the wrist or flex or extend the digits. Some of them are also used for abduction and adduction of the digits, but we're just going to look at a few of these. And the first of these muscles are the flexor carpi radialis and also the pronator teres. So take a look at the picture that you see here. This is a picture of the right arm and hand and now we're looking at the anterior aspect, that is with a palm facing us. And so the flexor carpi radialis is the green muscle. You can see that it originates on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Remember the medial epicondyle is that little bump that you feel just to the side of your elbow or funny bone. And this bump is an origin for a lot of very important muscles. So the flexor carpi radialis originates on the medial epicondyle and it inserts on metacarpals 2 and 3. And the function of the flexor carpi radialis, of course, is going to be flexion of the wrist. So when you're standing behind a car and somebody says, I need your help backing up, and you start waving them in with a backup gesture, that's when you're using your flexor carpi radialis muscle. Our next muscle is the pronator teres, and that also originates on the medial epicondyle of the humerus and inserts on the mid shaft of the radius. As the name implies, the function of the pronator teres muscle is pronation of the forearm. That is, turning the palm downward as if you were going to play professional basketball. Now, the pronator teres is actually the weakest of the two pronator muscles that we're going to look at in the forearm. And so it's really a synergist more than a prime mover. Now we're going to look at two flexor muscles that are still located on the anterior surface of the forearm. And these include the flexor digitorum profundus and also the flexor pollicis longus. Now flexor muscles are muscles that help to flex a joint. Remember flexing a joint helps to reduce the angle between two bones. And so the flexor digitorum act on the digits. The origin of the flexor digitorum profundus is the coronoid process of the ulna and the insertion are the distal phalanges 2 through 5. That is everything but your thumb. And the action here is to flex the distal interphalangeal joints. And so at right you can see a picture of somebody just flexing the distal interphalangeal joints. It's very hard to do it on its own and usually we flex all three of the joints at the same time. But here you can see somebody with just the distal interphalangeal joint flexed. The next muscle is the flexor pollicis longus. Now it's important to realize that the pollux is the thumb. And so these are going to be muscles that help with flexion of the thumb. The origin here is the anterior radius and interosseous membrane and the insertion is the distal phalanx or digit of the thumb. 
And so at the bottom picture, you can see somebody demonstrating the action of the flexor pollicis longus, and that is just to flex that last little digit of the thumb. So the last two muscles that you need to know that are associated with the anterior forearm are the pronator quadratus and also the supinator. So the pronator quadratus does pronation. We said that the pronator teres was a synergist of the muscle, but the pronator quadratus is the prime mover or agonist, and so it is the main muscle of forearm pronation. It originates on the distal shaft of the ulna and inserts on the distal shaft of the radius, and again assists with pronation. The next muscle is the supinator muscle, highlighted in orange here. The supinator muscle, of course, is a synergist of arm supination, that is holding your palms upwards as if you're going to hold a bowl of soup. Remember that the primary muscle of supination was actually the biceps brachii. And so the origin of the supinator muscle is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And so that's going to be the bump on the outside of your humerus, just distal to the funny bone. And the insertion here is the proximal part of the radius. And so again, the function of the supinator is to assist the biceps brachii muscle in supination of the forearm. Now we're going to take a look at the muscles of the posterior forearm, two of which are extensor muscles and one of which is a flexor muscle. Remember, an extensor helps to increase the angle between bones, whereas a flexor helps to decrease the angle between bones. And so the first of these muscles is the extensor digitorum, and it originates on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and inserts on the distal phalanges 2 through 5. And so this helps with extension of the fingers, that is putting them outright like you see on the right hand side, and also to splay or abduct the fingers. On the other hand, the extensor carpi ulnaris is function is to extend the wrist. So when you're placing your wrist parallel to your radius and ulna, this is extension of the wrist. The origin of the extensor carpi ulnaris is the lateral epicondyle, and insertion is the fifth metacarpal. And again, its function is to extend and also adduct the wrist. The last muscle here is actually a flexor, and that is the flexor carpi ulnaris, shown in green. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the pisiform and hamate bones of the wrist, and it helps with wrist flexion, so here you can see an example of flexion of the wrist, and also with adduction of the wrist. Okay, our next muscles are going to be flexors of the hip, and these are muscles that are located deep inside the body. The first of these is called the psoas major and the psoas major originates on the lumbar vertebrae and inserts on the lesser trochanter, the femur. The other muscle is the iliacus. The iliacus is found in the iliac fossa, that's where it gets its name, and it inserts on the lesser trochanter as well. And so both the psoas major and the iliacus help help to flex the thigh at the hip joint, as seen below, and collectively the psoas major and iliacus are known as the iliopsoas. Now, prior to coming to this class, you probably didn't hear much about these muscles, but they still are very important. The reason you probably don't hear very much about them is because they're not located on the outside of the body. You can't, you know, work out your psoas so people will be like, man, nice psoas. But in truth, the psoas is a muscle that you've probably come in contact with before because this is the same muscle that we find in the beef tenderloin of cattle that is used to make filet mignons. So if you ever get stranded on a boat and have to think about eating somebody, you might want to think about the psoas major because it's a very tasty muscle, at least in cows. If we look externally, a muscle that's found on the medial surface of the thigh is going to be the gracilis. The gracilis is a minor adductor muscle of the thigh. That is, it helps to close the legs together, as you can see uh, at the image below. The origin of the gracilis is the pubis, and the insertion is the proximal part of the medial tibia. So we said that the gracilis was a minor leg adductor, not very strong. If we look deep to the gracilis, we can see the very powerful adductor muscles, and these are the adductor brevis, the adductor magnus, and the adductor longus. So the adductor brevis and adductor magnus are shown here. The origin is on the pubis, and the insertion of both muscles is along the linea aspera of the femur. And these are very powerful thigh adductor muscles. And so to train these muscles, you would do that thigh adduction exercise that you see below. If we look lateral to the adductor muscles, we'll see a muscle complex which you're probably familiar with, and it's called the quadriceps femoris. Remember that quadriceps refers to the fact that it has four different heads, and each of these heads originates along the ilium and femur and all insert on the patella via the patellar tendon. 
And so instead of being really four different muscles, these are four heads of the same muscles. And the function of the quadriceps femoris muscle is principally going to be for flexion of the thigh and extension of the knee. Knee extension is pictured below is the major function of the quadriceps muscles. And so if you're kicking a soccer ball or something like that, that would be a very classic demonstration of the action of the quadriceps complex, that is extension of the knee. So I do expect you to memorize and be able to identify each of the four heads of the quadriceps complex. The first of these is the vastus lateralis. Remember the term vastus means large or vast, and lateralis refers to the fact that it's on the lateral side of the thigh. Just medial to the vastus lateralis is the rectus femoris. Remember rectus means straight, and femoris again refers to the femur. So probably this is the most conspicuous and strongest muscle of the quadriceps complex, the rectus femoris muscle. Underneath, or deep to the rectus femoris muscle, is a hidden muscle called the vastus intermedius, and lateral to the rectus femoris is another vastus muscle, the vastus medialis, and this is found on the medial side of the leg, just lateral to the adductor muscles. So together the quadriceps and the adductors make up the majority of the muscles on the anterior surface of the thigh. We also have two other very conspicuous muscles, and these include the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata. The sartorius is this purple belt-like muscle extending from the iliac spine all the way down to the medial side of the tibia, and it's a very long muscle with parallel fibers, and its action is a little bit of flexion, a little bit of abduction of the hip. Uh, mainly it helps us to cross our legs, and so for some reason they used to call it the tailor's muscle. The tensor fascia lata is the muscle pictured in green on the lateral side of the hip, and its origin here is the iliac crest, and insertion is a large band of connective tissue called the iliotibial tract. And the iliotibial tract attaches to the lateral side of the tibia, and the function of this muscle and its associated connective tissue is a little bit to assist in flexion and medial rotation of the thigh. Now we're going to move on to talk about the muscles of the posterior thigh and buttocks. So let's look at the buttocks first. And these include the muscles the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. Remember that the gluteus maximus is going to be the largest of the gluteal muscles. So here it originates along the iliac crest and sacrum and also a little bit on the coccyx and inserts on the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. And the function of the gluteus maximus muscle is extension of the thigh and hip and laterally rotating the thigh and hip. On the other hand, the gluteus medius and minimus are located deep to the gluteus maximus. Uh, the origin here is the ilium and insertion is the greater trochanter. And the function of the medius and minimus is to abduct and medially rotate the thigh. So when you do splits or jumping jacks, you're using your gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. Okay, now we're going to take a look a little bit lower at the hamstring muscles. The hamstrings consist principally of three muscles, the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and the biceps femoris. And the function of all of these muscles is to extend the thigh at the hip and also to flex the knee. So the first of these is the semimembranosus. The semimembranosus is a large muscle located on the medial side of the popliteal fossa. It originates on the ischial tuberosity, which is the basically your butt bone, it's what you're sitting on, and inserts on the medial condyle of the tibia. Overlapping the semimembranosus muscle is another muscle called the semitendinosus, and the semitendinosus has a long tendon, and that's how it can be differentiated from the membranosus, and lies partially superior uh, or above the semimembranosus. Its origin is also the ischial tuberosity, and insertion here is the shaft of the tibia. Just like the semimembranosus, it helps with extension of the thigh and flexion of the knee. And finally, the last muscle of the hamstrings is the biceps femoris. It's named for biceps because it has two heads. You don't have to know about the two heads, but just know that that's the name. The origin here is still the ischial tuberosity. Insertion is going to be on the head of the fibula. And so, just like the membranosus and the tendinosus, the function of the biceps femoris is to extend the thigh and flex the knee. Okay, we're going to wrap up this lecture by taking a look at some of the more important muscles of the lower leg. And in the back of the leg, we can see the two calf muscles, the gastric nemus and the soleus. And the gastric nemus and the soleus uh, help with plantar flexion, that is, pointing our toes downward. 
Now the gastric femus is the most superficial of these muscles. It originates on the femoral condyles and the soleus is located deep to it and its origin lies along the head of the fibula and medial tibia. Both of these muscles insert onto the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon or Achilles tendon. And again, the function of these muscles is for plantar flexion, pointing the toes downward. Okay, lastly but not leastly, we need to look at two or three muscles on the anterior surface of the leg. These include the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, and extensor hallucis longus. The tibialis anterior is the muscle that is pictured in purple. It originates on the lateral side of the tibia and the interosseous membrane and between the tibia and fibula, and it inserts on the first metatarsal and cuneiform. And its action here is for dorsiflexion of the foot, that is, pointing the toes upward. Helping out the tibialis anterior are the extensor digitorum longus. This originates from the lateral condyle of the tibia and inserts on the middle and distal phalanges. And the function of this muscle, as the name implies, is to extend and hyperextend the toes. And finally, the extensor hallucis longus originates on the fibula and inserts on the distal phalanx of the big toe, the hallux. And so the function of this muscle is just for the extension of the large toe, otherwise known as the hallux. So this concludes our lecture on the muscular system. Before you go on... So this concludes...